I recently saw an article that was supposed to connect the love we have for our spouse with the love Jesus has for the church. And it was somehow the worst thing I have ever read. And I read the Bible on this channel. I still can't get over the shoes. He said your feet didn't swell in 40 years. The least I can do is share just about every single horrible sentence with all of you. Prepare to be traumatized, because this article about sex is totally gonna rub you the wrong way. Sorry, that was gratuitous. Let's get two things out of the way. First, who wrote it? The article was written by Pastor Josh Butler, who heads up Redemption Tempe, a church in Arizona. His bio says he's the author of several critically acclaimed books, including Beautiful Union, which is amazing since that book doesn't even come out until April. Our man can time travel. Anyway, that book was written as a call for Christians to understand sex as a window into God's story of redemption. And an excerpt from that book was posted on the website of the Gospel Coalition. And that brings us to the second thing. What is the Gospel Coalition? Well, if you're not familiar with it, lucky you, it's a conservative Christian website notorious for having the worst takes on the biggest hot-button issues. From telling someone with a transgender colleague to never refer to her as she, to blaming the existence of bisexuals on social contagion, to claiming a man is no longer gay because his identity is in Jesus. Which is not how sexual identity works. But I'm glad that guy is into something. Now, if your article gets published by the Gospel Coalition, it means you have failed as a writer, and usually as a human which must be why Butler decided to go there with his piece about sex. He begins by mentioning how casual sex didn't do much for him when he was younger, because he was in college and had a few relationships that didn't work out. And you know what? That's fine. That's relatable. That's not weird. But then things go off the rails fast, because he just assumes that since casual hookups weren't for him, they must not be for anyone. Idolizing sex results in slavery. You can end up in the Egypt of a new romantic wasteland, more cynical and isolated than when you first began. Here's some advice. If you're ever thinking about comparing something to slavery, don't. Listen, dude, maybe you just weren't good at it. I'm not judging. There is a learning curve to it. You don't have to trash sex just because it wasn't fun for you at the time, or because you weren't sexually compatible with the person you were with. It never occurs to Butler that some people can handle it and enjoy it, and it enhances their lives. Or maybe it's exactly what they're looking for. You don't have to feel the same way to understand that other people can have different takes on this, and they're not necessarily wrong, even if it's not the path you prefer. But it's not enough that casual sex never worked for Butler. He needs to show you why sex within the context of marriage isn't just better, it's biblical. Just consider, he writes, how sex is an act of generosity for half of the people involved. Generosity involves giving extravagantly to someone. What deeper form of self-giving is there than sexual union where the husband pours out his very presence not only upon, but within his wife? Uh, wow. That got graphic, I think. There is nothing Jesus loves more than a husband who pours out his presence on and inside his wife. Both. It's the holy duality. Even if we overlook the extremely and unnecessarily specific language there, it is messed up that the only definition of generosity within sex that Josh Butler provides is the man doing stuff inside and upon his wife. 
That's literally, he writes, the best you've got to give. I guarantee, if you ask any sex therapist, or just anyone who has a healthy sex life, what generosity looks like in the bedroom, the answer would involve what you are doing for someone else. It's about the other person, not just you. But sex, as defined by Pastor Josh Butler, is something that is purposely selfish for only one side. It's about the man's pleasure. That's it. What about the woman, though? Does she have a role to play here, too? Of course, says Butler. God wants her to be a sexual homemaker, preparing space for her husband's outpouring. Hospitality, on the other hand, involves receiving the life of the other. You prepare a space for the guest to enter your home, welcoming him warmly into your circle of intimacy, to share your dwelling place with you. Here again, what deeper form of hospitality is there than sexual union, where the wife welcomes her husband into the sanctuary of her very self? Oh! Ew! Dude! What the f I swear to God, conservative Christians are absolutely incapable of talking about sex without being completely weird about it. All pastors are creepy about this topic in exactly the same way. Like they got together and said, here's the script everyone, now let's make sex too awkward for anyone to enjoy, ever. It's not that hard to just admit sex is fun without trying to deconstruct the whole thing. Not everything needs a biblical tie-in to be enjoyable. I like roller coasters. That's not mentioned in the Bible. That's okay, I promise. But Butler isn't done yet. He hasn't mentioned thrusting, much less thrusting in another language. The most frequent Hebrew phrase for sex is literally, he went into her. Wayabo eleha. The Bible is less prudish than we are, using more graphic language to describe what happens in the honeymoon tent. Tent? That's not an argument for why sex is good. That's an argument for why Florida Republicans probably want to ban the Bible before it gets into kids' hands. But even taking that passage at face value, just because an ancient translation describes something literally, doesn't mean the writers were purposely using graphic language. Butler is overanalyzing something pretty straightforward. He continues, One Sunday morning, I learned how graphic this language can be. My friend Karen... Oh no. Oh god, no. Where is he going with this? We were in Genesis 29, where Jacob marries Leah and Rachel, and the phrase Wayabo Eleha shows up, we discovered, a lot. Karen has, you might say, a rated G personality. Very prim, proper, and polite. We all saw her cheeks turn bright red, with a lot of awkward pauses, as she had to continually read the phrase, and Jacob went into her, over and over again. First of all, why is Karen reading that chapter aloud without knowing what's in it? That's her fault. If Karen can't handle what the Bible says, she shouldn't be reading it. And what is a rated G personality when you're an adult? You know what it means? It means you're too immature to even mention the word sex in a non-sexual environment. That's not a good quality. That's a sign you're very sheltered and unable to adult. Still, Butler makes it sound like the entire chapter reads like erotica. It's not. It would be far more interesting if it was. But in fact, if you click on the very link he includes there, which goes to a translation of Genesis 29, there are literally just two instances where the phrase went into her even shows up. And they're not even that awkward. Here, watch, I will read it for you. 
But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. That's it. She couldn't read those lines without turning red? Why is Butler exaggerating how sexual all that is? He wrote how Karen had to continually read that phrase over and over again. It was a lot. It shows up two times. There are all kinds of things messed up about that chapter of the Bible. I know. I made an entire video about it. Give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. But the sanitized language used to describe one guy having sex with two different women isn't one of them. And it's really strange that Butler wants to highlight the language in that section while glossing over the whole polygamy with sisters is cool thing the Bible has going on right there. Anyway, it turns out all of that was just background for what Butler really wanted to talk about. Honeymoon sex. He takes us to a hypothetical honeymoon in a Mexican resort. On that honeymoon in Cabo, the groom goes in to his bride. He is not only with his beloved, but within his beloved. He enters the sanctuary of his spouse, where he pours out his deepest presence and bestows an offering, a gift, a sign of his pilgrimage, that has the potential to grow within her into new life. I can't believe I'm reading this. There are kids watching this video! Okay, okay, one more honeymoon passage before we discuss. Back in the wedding suite, the bride embraces her most intimate guest on the threshold of her dwelling place and welcomes him into the sanctuary of her very self. She gladly receives the warmth of his presence and accepts the sacrificial offering he bestows upon the altar within her most holy place. Yeah, clearly a sacrifice for the guy. You see kids, according to conservative Christians, a honeymoon is when two virgins spend their first moments of holy matrimony with one person inside another. At which point, probably about 30 seconds into the act, the male enters the sanctuary, marking his deepest presence inside of the woman, and pours out a liquidy communion wafer offering. Or, if you want to be extra creepy about it, a sign of his pilgrimage. Purity culture is so damn weird. Like I said, these people are totally incapable of describing sex in a normal way. It's also telling that Butler refers to a woman's vagina as the most holy place. As if that's the only part of her that has spiritual value. You know what you will never find on the Gospel Coalition's website? An article in which a woman's brain gets the same description. Side note. In 2001, the controversial pastor Mark Driscoll got criticized because he referred to women as a penis home. It's a long, crazy story. Have fun googling it. But here is Josh Butler taking penis home and learning nothing from that incident and adding several more layers to it. You know what's interesting about his description of the honeymoon consummation? There's no mention of foreplay. There's no mention of satisfying her needs. There's no mention of how sex between a couple can still be meaningful without it leading to childbirth. And there definitely isn't any mention of how deranged the underlying premise is. Butler is just assuming both people are virgins and they're having sex for the first time on their honeymoon, which is just a horrible idea, and that everything is bound to be perfect, which for many virgins will absolutely not be the case. A lot of evangelical women have spent years pointing out how damaging that kind of mentality has been to so many of them, and this pastor doesn't care at all. 
This is the sort of article you write when you're a Christian guy who has never spent any time thinking about a woman's sexual desires. Sex, to Josh Butler, is what a man does to a woman. Not with her, just upon her. The pleasure only goes in one direction. Obviously, no other combinations are permitted. Sorry, same-sex couples. And procreation must always be the end goal. Sorry, infertile Christians, but you don't matter to Josh Butler. And instead of just talking about the joy of the act, or mentioning that it usually takes some time for two people to discover their sexual chemistry, if it exists at all, which it may not, he's trying to prose it up and wrap sex in biblical packaging. Like a Jesus-shaped condom, if you will. What the f And all of that leads us to Butler's big revelation. This is why he wrote the article. Because having sex with your wife is exactly like Jesus making sweet, sweet love to a church. This is a picture of the gospel. Christ arrives in salvation to be not only with his church, but within his church. Christ gives himself to his beloved with extravagant generosity, showering his love upon us and imparting his very presence within us. Christ penetrates his church with the generative seed of his word and the life-giving presence of his spirit, which takes root within her and grows to bring new life into the world. Yeah, thrust that church, Jesus. Do it continually. Do it over and over again. Shower your Jesus jizz all over the congregation until we feel your presence inside us. Wayabo Eleha the hell out of that building until you unleash your seed all over and within our bodies to the point where we all need holy cigarettes. God, I'm sorry about that. Look, if there is any truth to this horribly strained metaphor, it's that Jesus leaves a lot of people unsatisfied, which I'm guessing is something Josh Butler knows quite a bit about, given his descriptions of sex. I think my favorite thing about this article were the reactions to it from people, many of whom are practicing Christians, who could not believe anyone would publish this garbage. Here, just enjoy these. It's not just random people on Twitter, though. As I mentioned earlier, the thing about this article is that it's not just a one-off piece of trash. It's an excerpt from a book, which means Josh Butler wrote an entire book about sex, despite clearly knowing nothing about the subject. He is just like those girl-defined vloggers who think they are sexperts even though every time they open their mouths, they remind us of how little they know about the subject. The word is yada. The word <laughs> is so often used to describe God wanting a deep and intimate yeah. relationship with us, but that same word in the Hebrew, yada, is also used throughout scripture when the Bible's talking about the intimate act of sexual intimacy yeah. that a husband is having with a wife. He wants to go deep with us. That is why he created mm -hmm. us. He wants us to, he wants to yada us and for us mm. to yada him back. I am very uncomfortable with the energy that we've created in the studio today. And just to be clear, I am not knocking abstinence. If you choose to wait until marriage, okay, no judgment from me, I don't care. Good luck to you. But if you wait until marriage, 
and only have one sexual partner, you should at least have the self-awareness to realize there's probably a lot you don't understand about the subject. You have a sample size of one. You should leave the advice giving to people who know a lot more, whether through studying it or, yes, through personal experience. I don't want an abstinence advocate to offer sex advice just like I don't want a 16-year-old teaching me how to drive a car. Pastor Josh Butler has no self-awareness. And if you consider that the excerpts given to websites by publishers usually represent the best parts of a book, that means there are hundreds of pages that are somehow even worse than this. Now, since the article was published, the fallout has been kind of amazing to watch. One writer, who had provided a blurb for the book, has now retracted it in the wake of Butler's article. He wrote that, in poor judgment, he read only 25 to 30 percent of it before writing something nice for Butler to use on the cover or on the inside of the book. Which, I have to say, is kind of weird since the excerpt comes from chapter one. But Rich Velotis said, I was wrong to write an endorsement for something I didn't fully read. Hey, guess what? That is also atheist's biggest criticism of most pastors. He is not alone, though. Another writer, Danae Pierre, also retracted her endorsement. She also admitted she only did a quick skim and assumed his tone in pursuing God was more than enough to endorse this one. Did anyone read this book? I'm beginning to think even his publishers didn't really pay any attention to it. But once again, a voice of Christian authority endorsed something she never read because she thought the overarching idea was valuable. That is the story of religion writ large. Just remember that the next time a Christian tells you the Bible is awesome. Almost none of these people have seriously read it. Their eyes may have skimmed over the pages, but they did not really pay close attention. There's more. Butler also said in his bio that he was, quote, leading a seven-week online cohort on the Christian sexual ethic, which makes about as much sense as George Santos teaching a class on honesty. But that bio was removed from the article. And the article itself has now been removed from the Gospel Coalition's website. Do you know how bad an article has to be to get taken down from that website given all the crap they publish? The article has since been replaced by an open letter from the Gospel Coalition saying, We accepted Josh's resignation as a Keller Center Fellow. He will no longer lead an online cohort with the Center, nor speak at TGC 23. Fine. Whatever. I mean, he's canceling himself, not me. But notice that they don't distance themselves from anything he wrote. TGC is fine with the anti-women, immature sex stuff. They just don't like the backlash. And that's not all. Butler was scheduled to present more on this topic at a recent conference geared toward Christian women. His pre-recorded breakout session was titled, Beautiful Union, God's Vision for Sex. But after the publication of the article, he was apparently removed from the lineup. Someone finally realized women should not be taking sex advice from a guy who views them as nothing more than some holy receptacle. It just goes to show you that putting pastor in front of your name and claiming to be a Jesus follower will always override expertise for a certain group of very gullible Christians. Okay, one last thing, and I know this one is petty. The image that went along with Butler's article on the Gospel Coalition's website was this stock photo from Jacob Rank on Unsplash, which features a woman wearing an engagement ring. That means the main image for the creepy sex article features the hands of two people who are not even married yet. Which means the person who picked that photo did about as much research on this topic as Josh Butler. 
I am begging conservative Christians to just stop being so damn weird and awkward when it comes to talking about sex. We have decades worth of stories about how badly you are doing it, and it's clear no lessons have been learned. So please, just focus on ruining your own relationships. Stop trying to ruin everyone else's.